chapter four. Here we are. Um, we're going to begin by talking about L.J. Roberts' work. Um, and you're visiting from Brooklyn. Brooklyn. So again, another person who came to town. Um, L.J.'s work takes craft, which is something, you know, a tradition that's really um, placed with the amateur, with people who aren't like professional artists, and reworks that to give voice to a feminist, trans, and queer experience. Um, and uh, you can see LJ's work here, the fence um, piece, and then there's also two hanging banners, and there's a larger hanging banner um, in the center piece. So do you want to pick up and talk more about your work and maybe the individual pieces? Sure. Um, I can kind of start chronologically and with a little story, which is that um, I grew up in a really, really conservative area of Detroit that um, didn't, there was no difference in it at all, and I was sent at age 16 to a boarding school that basically tried to de-queer me in a really regimented way, which is now actually illegal in California. They just passed legislation which outlawed that, which is wonderful. And so um, I left there and went to college in Vermont to basically deal with a lot of gender and sexuality, coming out issues that I was having. And I picked up knitting, which my grandmother had taught me how to do when I was seven. Um, she's a really fabulous textile artist and also abstract painter, and she's still working at 85. And um, so she taught me to knit and sew and embroider when I was seven, and I picked that up again. And I was taking sculpture classes, I injured myself, and my work became entirely based around textiles. And in the process of kind of coming out, which I think is still ongoing in my life all the time, I um, knitted that pink triangle, and I was also living in a radical environmental co-op at the time, and I was at the University of Vermont, which has a really amazing activist culture, and I was living with people who were in Earth First, and I was tagging along with them while they were dropping banners off of staples and locking themselves to shelves with u locks and taking pictures for them to use with their press releases. And so I learned a lot of direct action activism from them, and um, decided to come out by hanging the pink triangle from the tallest building in Vermont, which is the church steeple on the campus. Um, which, there's a photo of that. Yeah, there's yeah. a photo of us yeah. dropping the banner, um, which says mom knows now, which <laughs> she's, she's come a long way, to, you know, 12 <laughs> years later, and just bought my partner a juicer, so like, we're doing really well. And um, so my work, is really concerned with the intersections of feminism, trans, and queer politics, and um, kind of collective action, direct action, um, the ongoing AIDS epidemic, and protest. And um, I've also been really influenced by a lot of stuff that was done in the 80s and 90s by groups like ACT UP and Queer Nation, and um, Women's Health Action Mobilization Project, and um, I'm, very, I'm very involved in kind of visual aids back in New York and a lot of kind of community-based stuff. Um, and for me, textiles is an embodiment of, a ref it reflects those politics because there's so much political kind of charged energy in textiles in terms of how it's been positioned in labor and in art and how the trajectory of craft in America. Um, all of the work you see here was actually shown on the street before it ever went into a gallery or a museum, and that feels really important. Um, after I hung the pink triangle, I went to grad school in San Francisco um, because they had a textiles program out there that taught me how to kind of be a jack of all trades of textiles. And I actually also went to work with Tammy Ray Carland, um, who I was worked with right away because I think they knew I wouldn't stay if I wasn't placed with like really <laughs> queer professors. And um, I, this was my master's thesis project, which was um, knitted entirely on toy children's knitting machines. One that I bought off the internet that's pink and sparkly, and the other was a Barbie knitting machine from 1974 um, that belonged to one of my professors, Tina Takamoto. And the whole fence is hand woven, and I was really interested in the idea of um, barriers and impermeability and kind of a lot of issues of immigration of gender and sexuality. And there were a lot of immigration debates that are still raging, but were really raging in San Francisco when I made it. Um, prison industrial complex politics. 
Um, and then like my own kind of working through my own experience in a boarding school that was very confining. And then um, the banners were found imagery. The banner over there is from a postcard that was found in the militancy archive of the Lesbian History Archives. And this poster was on an ex-lover's fridge for years and years that was made at um, the queer eruption gathering that was at the Dumba Collective in Brooklyn in 1999. Um, it was done, designed by uh, Matt Height and also was a, in a limp wrist album as an album insert. And um, since then, my work, I'm doing a lot of small embroideries right now, portraits of um, queer and trans friends who are very involved in activism and cultural production in New York City. And then I'm also embroidering um, a collection of ephemera that was passed down to me that was all kind of radical queer ephemera from the 80s and 90s that belonged to a friend of mine who is very involved in fat positive politics, sex positive politics, um, issues of race, of trans politics, of feminism, of AIDS, of prevention. It's just kind of this amazing archive of intersectional politics that I'm embroidering a likeness with a single strand. Um, and then another work that has been recent was a map of all the queer collective houses in Brooklyn, which is kind of the seat of my community right now. So, um, yeah, that's about okay. it. <laughs> uh, this room is for Faith Levine, who came here all the way from Milwaukee. So thanks for coming. Um, and uh, Faith is a documentary filmmaker and photographer and Artist, an artist and, curator. and curator and gallery owner, time, you know, so you, um, <laughs> and event organizer with the Arts versus Crafts yeah. um, series. So, fair. Uh, fair. So, yes, yeah, so Faith is a, a woman of many hats. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, her work is looking at um, alternative communities, DIY communities um, in the American context. Um, this series of photographs um, are photographs that you took during a trip visiting some of these off-the-grid alternative communities, um, I think mostly in the South and in the Midwest. Yeah, I can. You, you can, you, she, can she can give like the full spiel. But a lot of her work is sort of like documenting um, these spaces um, in, an, in, an, uh, in an effort to kind of uh, both see people who are like trying to create a world that they want to live in and also um, actively produce that world. So do you want to take it up and maybe kind of walk through all the other projects? Sure. Okay. Um, so first of all, the, it's, it's very strange for me to see all this work in, in one room together. Um, and I guess maybe I'll start chronologically as well, but that basically is rooted in, for me, in zine making, which I guess is on the first floor. And so I was lucky enough to grow up um, on the, in the suburbs of Seattle where there was a really amazing community of um, punks basically and we had access to this all ages venue that basically changed my entire life and so it was through learning what zines were that sort of opened up my community into where I'm at now and zines were really transformative beyond the music because it was something that I felt like I it, it just it spoke to me in a way on a lot of levels but the the no rules factor was really like life-changing for me and then being able to go to Kinko's and and have pen pals and have this community outside of my suburb and so a lot of the people who are connected with all three of the projects in this room and then further in my life are all from that time period who I was pen pals with who I'm still in contact with so um, let's see there is a slideshow and a book from Handmade Nation, which was... Um, Those are on the left side on of the, this wall, the yeah. book in the, the left uh, projection. The left projection. So Handmade Nation was a project that um, I, I had gotten really... I had always made things by hand. It came out of DIY and through the, the punk scene. And craft was a vessel that... The, it just I knew people who always made stuff, so I was really hesitant, and I was a late comer to the internet. And so when I started going online, which would be 2001, 2002, because I thought that I wouldn't write letters anymore if I started emailing, which is true. Um, <laughs> I started interacting with a larger community that I didn't realize I would have access to, and it kind of became a part of this DIY craft scene that sort of came out of that. And I, as a maker, I started participating in these craft fairs, which then I started a craft fair in Milwaukee, where I moved in 2001, because I wanted that energy to be there. 
and the community had grown so important to me I felt like and it was beginning to get this attention and get co-opted in a way that I was worried if it didn't get documented in a, in a respectful manner that someone was going to make a film about like cute girls making crafts and that's it, it was much more to me than that so I had my, my best friend was a filmmaker and I asked her if she wanted to shoot a documentary which I had never done before but I knew I could I did but it's so and then the book came out of that project um, and it went on to connect me with a lot more people who I work with now I opened up a store that featured um, handmade artists and I had a gallery and I started curating shows um, so through that time and from making zines and from making art continually I had always been interested in, in letters and in handwriting and I had a bunch of friends, I lived in Minneapolis for a few years, that started hanging out at a sign shop in the um, late 90s. And that was kind of my first access to finding out that there was sign painters. I had always been interested in letters and urban lands landscapes. And that sort of set in the back of my mind. And that group of friends has all moved on now in their mid-30s to have full-time sign shops around the country. So when Handmade Nation wrapped up, I decided I wanted to do a documentary about sign painters because there was very little act, uh, like information online and I feel a, as a researcher if you can add quality content to the internet at this point that's really beneficial and so in 2010 what year is it yeah 2010 <laughs> 2009 I uh, approached my friend my friend Sam Macon who's a co-director and co-author of sign painters about doing that project and that came out the book came out in 2012 and the film was released in May and the film will be screening next week in downtown at the um, downtown Pittsburgh in the Harris Theater through AIGA and Pittsburgh filmmakers as part of the exhibition. Um, so that project has been really, it was really interesting. Obviously, the, the Handmade Nation was predominantly women, mostly just because that was the community that I was tapped into. There was definitely some men at the time who were involved in that community. It was... Mm, I didn't feel it was important to make a gender balance film. Um, and then on the opposite side, the sign painter film is almost all men with a couple women, and I felt like it represented the trade accurately as well. Um, and then just to jump over to these photos really quickly, which have, this is, a, these photos are actually all from w one location, and they were shot um, for the most part all during one trip. This is my friend's land in North Carolina. And it, it's a part of a larger photo essay project about off-the-grid land communities and land projects, which for me is really important, again, as a community space, as a safe space, as a queer-friendly space, and as an alternative to everything else. And all of these projects for me are just ways for me to show people that there are different ways that we can choose to live our lives. Part of my process and interest is um, I just want to, I want people to see and have access to the fact that there are alternatives and we don't have to do things the way that they're presented to us. And the land project photos, I feel like with a lot of my work will have more importance in 20 years. For me, when you know, pre-internet, when, when I was a teenager, the, when you got access to like one image that could change your, like seeing one image, there's this image of Jack Smith, who is this artist from New York, in drag, and I had it from like some art magazine, and I cut it out, and I remember it was in my room, in, like from junior high and through high school, and like one image can make the biggest influence on your aesthetics. I mean, now we're, we have Im like content overload, but some of these images, because I have, I have access to these spaces and these communities, I feel like they're important now, but I'd like to think that they'll be more important later to show another generation that, you know, in 2013 people were still choosing to make these choices and not um, necessarily involve themselves in corporate and power dynamics that exist. So I, I guess that's basically it for now. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much. Yeah. Um, work by Stephanie Sihuko. Um, it's all this in, in the middle and then this wall. And Stephanie lives in San Francisco. She is not here tonight. She just um, finished a crazy series of residencies in multiple countries and then just started uh, teaching at UC Berkeley. She just got tenure. Do you want to? 
Oh, yeah, so Stephanie um, grew up in the Bay Area. She grew up in San Francisco. And as a teenager, she was involved with the Women's Action Coalition and was very inspired by the, um, you know, the sort of riot girl activity that was happening in uh, San Francisco at the time. Um, one of the things that really influenced her is sort of these DIY networks that were established, um, zine making, flyers, these kind of tactile ways of communicating information and building community through the exchange of information. Um, uh, the other kind of important aspect of her work is um, open source and copy left. And so you see that in all of the pieces that are here in the show. Um, we are showing uh, three separate works um, by Stephanie. Um, what you see here is the Counterfeit Crochet Project, where she... Um, these two. These two, the, areas. These two areas, where she um, invited people from all over the world to um, take designs of expensive you know, designer handbags and knit them themselves. So it's kind of like a tactile piracy. Um, and then um, this other work um, uh, is uh, the artist's entire stolen... Um, uh, music collection from her iTunes, and she's um, repackaged them and is reselling them in the space. Um, and then the free text um, piece behind us, um, she basically has taken. Um, turn what? Turn around. Oh, sorry, I have to turn around. <laughs> sorry. Uh, free text. Um, she basically has taken. Uh, uh, articles, mostly critical theory um, articles um, that are, uh, you know, being shared illegally online, and then um, um, the URL addresses for those pirated articles. Um, she makes them available through these pull tags, and so, you're welcome to yeah. pull the tags. So this isn't like a precious thing that's mm -hmm. sort of removed. And also um, the counterfeit crochet. She has books too, and she invites people to sit here and crochet um, their own uh, Louis Vuitton handbags. So I just want to mention that. <laughs> For the free text, um, Stephanie invited all the artists who are in the exhibition to um, to to Submit, add their to add important content. Text. So, um, like feminist feminist theory that was involved, important for them, queer theory that was important for them. So, some of and these, anything else and yeah. anything else. So, some of the some of the um, posters here are um, you know uh, texts that the artists in the show recommended to be up here. Um, Okay, okay, so should we move to Ginger? Yeah. Okay. So this is Ginger Brooks Takahashi. She lives in North Braddock. Do you have a mic? And now you're my <laughs> mic stand. <laughs> Here, you can have my mic. And oh, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> um, and Ginger makes, um, I, it's awkward saying this like five inches from your face. But Ginger <laughs> makes community-based um, experiences and a lot of uh, collective and collaborative works. She also made three new works for this exhibition, which she'll talk about in a minute. Um, there's a, oh, I guess, I guess I'll let you go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, this, what's interesting for me is that this, my part of the show represents the past 17 years of my work, and I've never showed that much of a range before. Um, a lot of my work is collaborative, as Astria mentioned, and this ranges from work that's in this uh, vitrine over here with the MP3 player, uh, recording projects and bands that I played in from, I guess, the late 90s to... Mid 90s. Mid 90s, right, <laughs> we figured this out. Um, from then until now, and the latest collaborative piece is this wall behind us. And this is a wallpaper print that I made with Dana Bishop Root, who here. is also here. And we are working with our neighbors and other others to open a general store in our neighborhood in North Braddock, um, which is just outside of Pittsburgh for those of you who are from out of town. Um, and in this vitrine, right to my right, are um, it's it's the work of LTTR, which um, was a feminist and genderqueer uh, annual art journal, and we made five issues, and they're they're ones they're issues that you can handle and look at, and then. Um, the issues are kind of exploded out um, with all the artist multiples inside the vitrine. And then the monitor next to it is um, images from us making the journals and uh, events, performances, all kinds of, all the bodies that were involved in our project. And then 
At the other end is an older project. On the wall. On the wall, the framed piece. And it's a document of a project called Projet Mobilivre Bookmobile Project. And that was a touring exhibit of artist books and zines that traveled around the US and Canada um, from 2000, oh, I'm getting all the years wrong. 2000, 2002 to 2006, and um, it was all in an Airstream trailer, and there are photos of it there. And the map is mapping up, mapping out influences as well as some of the tour routes that we took. So on the floor. Oh, and on the floor, <laughs> right, is um, a new piece. There are two new pieces on the floor. Um, these are collected T-shirts from my personal collection, shirts that I made, friends made. Um, and on these bodies, um, this piece is called Feminist Body Pillow. Um, and then behind everybody in the crowd is another new piece with Driftwood. And the title is, <laughs> this is a new piece. Um, with a long title. There is a group, if not an alliance, walking there too, whether or not they are seen. And this is from a Judith Butler text. Thank you, Ginger. Thank you. So thanks again to all the artists, everyone who has helped us with the show. Um, anyone else? To Cece. To Astria. My co-curator. <laughs>